Just as I was coming up on stage, <clears throat> pardon my voice, a range of friends asked me, do you want a pointer? Do you have slides to present? And I have a confession to make. I don't use PowerPoint. Hopefully, by the end of my talk, I will left behind a powerful point for us. Uh, we all live in very exciting times. So exciting that every day we are challenged with a change. So recently, talking to some of my colleagues and friends, and the nervousness they faced as a result of the presidential elections in the US, looking at what happened in Brexit, and back home in our own backyard, the demonetization and all the stories that we have around it. You know, a friend asked me some time ago, you live in a forest, you live in villages, how has it impacted rural India? Suddenly somebody thinks of rural India. And are the ATMs working? And I had to sort of quietly to remind them that rural India is a great place to live in because urban India is grappling with this concept of less cash economy and cashless economy. Urban India works in a Rural India works on no cash economy. <laughs> so we really have no cash at all to worry about. And so we don't have to have an ATM to spend. And if you look at the recent <coughs> Oxfam report, three Indians, and how much they won. <coughs> the top 1% of India owning 58% of India as well. So while we, we could always change the narrative and say 99% of India owns only 42% of India as well. But we don't, right? That's because the narrative comes from the World Economic Forum. And I come from an India which is very different. I come from an India which for most of you is a faint old distant Bharat. And with all the challenges that we face. And so it's beautiful when you read in our newspapers that our young engineers in Israel are actually have a technology today where they can send 103 satellites into space with one rocket. But the highest any country in the world can even imagine. You're fascinated by that. And the next minute you see our Prime Minister talking about building toilets. And you really start wondering, which part of the world are you in, right? If we have, possibly the only country in the world where a bullock cart can travel to Mercedes-Benz on the same road. And we don't bat an eyelid about it, right? Many times we all go through our lives living this world of contradictions without getting affected by it. That's the beauty of Indians. We become so very used to these contradictions, these paradoxes, that nothing disturbs us. Or rather, we don't allow ourselves to be disturbed. And that's the point I'm trying to make. We just don't want to be disturbed in their beliefs. And looking back at my own life many, many years ago, it suddenly looks very far away when I see all the black hairs in this room today. And as a 19 year old who thought I could change the world, I actually believe I can still change it. But I'm not sure the world is ready to be changed yet. And being in, being in a ward in medicine, a medical student, who, you know, as medical students, there are few doctors in this room, you want to be the first one to get into the hospital early in the morning. You'd have the clinical part of the program in the mornings. Because the patients in a government hospital don't know how to distinguish a third year medical student from a final year medical student or a postgraduate or a professor even, except that they look older. So when you're the first person to go make the first admission in the ward, that patient believes that you're the first doctor and you're the only doctor ever. And he would sort of pour out his life story to you, the miseries, and you act like a big doctor. And I still remember holding on to the x-ray film the reverse way. Holding on to the ECG reverse. But pretending to tell the patient that you know everything about his heart. And I, I still remember the end, this patient, around 44 years old, diagnosed as idiopathic malignant hypertension. The, the doctors use magical words to confuse patients. Essentially trying to say, I'm an idiot, I haven't figured out what the hell is wrong with you. But we call it idiopathic, saying that we have no, no, no real reason for the disease. And this patient is 44 year, year old, unmarried person from a rural village in Mysore district, not responding to treatment at all. Every morning the professor would come and there would be 24, 25 people behind him and the third years would be the last in line and trying to understand why he's not responding to treatment. Every day this magical discussion about changing the medicine, change that medicine and try the step care regime, this works, this does not work, try this, that does not work, try this and all this happening and a month later I come into the ward and you see an empty bed. And a typical government hospital where I studied, a 
An empty bed means, empty cot means, the patient died the previous day and the bed has gone for fumigation and he'll be back the next day. And that's the first time I noticed a very elderly 70-year-old woman crying and trying to pack her things back into a small plastic bag. And this lady, suddenly you suddenly hits you because you're supposed to have done all this history taking, right? You've done all this family history and personal history and all that. And suddenly you recognize the man who died also has a mother. And this mother is shedding her tears because she's lost the only son she had, an unmarried 44-year-old man who was working as a cook, trying to cook his way to life and different marriages and functions. And she's lost the only emotional support she had, the only economic support she had. And she's crying, not because she, uh, she's lost her son alone, but also because she can't even take the body back home. She has no money. And this is a government hospital. And I'm the first man in a white coat she meets. And she sort of downloads all the anger and the hatred and all the negativism she's built up against doctors. And here I'm trying to convince this old lady, no, no, your son died not because of us, but because he was not responding to treatment. And I told, we gave you so many medicines. Every morning the professor dictates, the nurses write down and they give us a paper. And then she broke down and said, where did you give me medicines? What you gave me were pieces of paper. They were not medicines. And this is in a government hospital in India. We have already heard about the dichotomy with the Indian health system. When they're supposed to be giving medicines, and this patient, for 35 days of treatment, when I was actually there in the ward, was actually getting a piece of paper, being changed every two to three days, in the hope that the medicines are not working. But what the fact was that all of us had missed that so the patient was not even getting any medicines because the mother couldn't afford to buy any medicines. He had not died of malignant hypertension. It simplistically died of untreated hypertension. And that was a paradox I could not solve. And I said, this is not the career I wanted. After all, I had tried engineering for a few days and ran away from that. And I thought medicine was going to change my world. And I thought I can't be a doctor anymore. I just can't take this pressure of living in a system where you actually think you can change it, but then the system is so overwhelmingly powerful that you're just an ordinary player in the whole game. I thought I'd drop out of medical school again. But then, two years before that, something happened to me. Swami Vivekananda came into my life. <coughs> Extraordinary man, great philosopher, patriot, nationalist. You can describe him the way you want him to, depending on the lens that you wear. And here I saw in my eyes an extraordinary socialist. At 17, I believe every one of us is a socialist. We all are committed to bring in equality in this country, whatever way possible. We all subscribe to this philosophy of inequities not existing at all. And being inspired by him, being inspired by his powerful personality and message, where he calls and says, every young man should actually create his own destiny. He needs to actually be the maker of his own destiny. Here I was inspired by him, wanting to drop out of medical school. Because I couldn't take the pressure of what I saw, the inequity in front of me. Then I decided, I'm not going to be part of the system. If I don't like the canvas, I'm not going to complain. I'm going to repaint it my way. And that was the day I began what is now known as the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement, an organization of young people then, young even now, who actually believe we can change this world, we can make this a better place. And, and as, we, as I walked on this journey, I realized the power in the message of Swami Vivekananda is not, cannot be just limited to one country or one, unfortunately today, to one religion but something much more wider to a large audience of young people. Because we keep calling him an icon for the youth without even understanding what he meant. And what I would like to share with you today is a message, a very simplest message he gave. And I think at your age, if you can hear that message, he said, all you need to make your own destiny. This is 3H, he said. It seems a very simple formula, but the formula works. It worked for me, it worked for a lot of people I worked with. The first H, he said, is the heart to feel. You know, most of us have forgotten how to feel. He said, feel, my children, feel. Feel for the poor, the marginalized, the downtrodden. Feel till your heart, your mind reels and your heart stops and you fall down dead. That's the power of feeling, he said. Can we feel? Can we all sit back and feel? For the 40% of Indians, even today who don't have 40 liters of drinking water per day. Can we really feel for the 60% of Indians who have no access to a toilet? Can we feel for the 74% of our women in villages who are suffering from iron deficiency anemia? Something 12 rupees a year can cure. 
and really feed for the children. 60% of them, who, and all the, amongst all the children who enroll in the first grade, 60% don't complete the 10th grade. Can you feel for that? Can you feel and want to make a difference? And out of that feeling comes the next step that Swami Vivekananda said, the head to think. Now, we are all in privileged institutions, acquiring competences beyond even belief nowadays. You know, we have young children, four, five years old, playing away on the cell phones and talking about so many stuff, I couldn't even imagine I would have done it four or five. We, are, we all belong to a generation where we talk of artificial intelligence and big data management and all that, but unfortunately we don't talk of being human anymore. You know, we live in a generation where we want to master the world, but we forgot how to master ourselves. And if we can get that head to think, get those simple solutions, other extraordinary solutions that India needs, that simple 20 rupee solution that can fetch drinking water to rural India. A simple 20 drop of sodium hypochlorite, which we can do in our own villages and not the big rivers osmosis machines we need. Can you think of such simple things? And we can. And then beyond this thinking, we can understand the hands to work. We can all not feel and think and stay in this cozy air conditioned rooms of ours. But can we actually get out there, go into our villages, go into rural India and try to do it, make a difference? For that, what we need are people, not just ordinary people, but people who are makers of their own destiny. People who believe that leadership is not about leading others. Leadership is about inspiring yourself first. It's about making yourself first. Making yourself to do what you think is the right thing to do in this world and to make a difference. And drawing from his message, if I could crystallize and distill out qualities, what I call the eightfold path that we can draw from the extraordinary heritage of India, from the Upanishads of the Bhagavad Gita, from what people like Vivekananda reiterated to us, eight messages that we can take forward. And the first is compassion. Can we actually live? And compassion is not just feeling for the others. Compassion is action driven. Can you actually do something about others? Vivekananda said it so beautifully in a letter to the Mysore Maharaja, the place where I come from. He said it, he said, they alone live who live for others. The rest are more dead than alive. So life is about living it for others. So don't, don't just imagine being an engineer. I keep asking these young children today, what do you want to be? And they would say an engineer, a doctor, a biomedical engineer, biotechnology, whatever, all the fancy words we have. Can we be an engineer to do something? Can you actually be a doctor to be something? Not just doctoring illnesses, treatment of diseases, but something more than that. Can you actually be a good doctor today? Can you be a good engineer, good scientist? Where the only, only dictum of our life could be, am I actually practicing science for the sake of others? Can I live my life for others? The second is faith and hope. He said, you can have faith in all the 33 million gods you have created for yourself, but if you have no faith in yourself, you're an atheist. So can we have faith in ourselves? We can actually change the world. When you talk to people, they say, oh my God, India is such a big country. Oh, we can't do anything. We can't. We are a nation where you know, God down the drain, all this nonsense we hear. Can you actually have faith and say, I am the change, and I am going to be the change, I am going to drive the change. It's already happening, and people around the world are rising, and I think you are no exception. And hope that tomorrow will be better. We always imagine tomorrow to be better only when it comes to our personal lives. Can you imagine a hope for a social reconstruction of this country itself, and it can happen. The third quality. The spirit of positivism. Now, you don't start off saying, will I pass this exam? You start off saying, I'm going to pass this exam. And that's a huge difference. This morning I was talking to some people, friends here, and they said, oh, I'm not sure I want to do this. What do you mean, I'm not sure? All you can be sure of doing it. All you can't be sure is whether you're going to pass or fail. That's irrelevant. But be sure of what you want to do. And that kind of hope that I can actually, that positivism, that I can actually do something about. For the sense of humor, Let's laugh. Not laugh at others, that's what we're all trained to do, but laugh with others. That kind of sense of humor. And then the spirit of inquiry. Can we constantly ask questions? Now, we are all trained. Our universities and colleges actually train our students to feel more and more competent about themselves. They train themselves to get A grades, and we keep repeating it in your classes. You're damn good, you're very good, you get a distinction. You have a CGPA 10 out of 10. They train you to believe that you're actually very good. But I would like universities to train our students not to feel competent, but actually to make them feel incompetent. Can you actually train you to operate from zones of incompetence? 
And from that spirit of operating from a zone of incompetence, you'll actually have the humility to learn. The desire to drive change, we're asking questions. And when you get that space, that practicing that spirit of self-inquiry, the feeling is so beautiful. The next quality is fearlessness. Can we actually get you to be so fearless, like jumping off the ledge kind of thing that we heard now, can you actually be that fearless? And our philosophy, the Indian construct of fearlessness is not about courage at all. It's the beauty of India. It talks of fearlessness not as an absence of courage, but as the ability to transcend fear. And that is the kind of young entrepreneurs we need today. People who can go beyond themselves, see beyond themselves and take that final plunge into God knows what. But with the confidence that they're going to make a change, with the positive concept that they're going to actually live the change. And finally, can we have that spirit of mindfulness? Can we be constantly mindful and asking ourselves questions of who am I? Why am I born? What am I doing? What is the purpose of my life? Is my purpose just to get a degree here? Is my purpose just to get a damn good job tomorrow? Or is it something more? Remember, the world needs you. The world needs you not because you are important. The world needs you because there is no hope without you. Remember, even today, half the world's population, three and a half billion people, live on less than two dollars a day. Less than only two million, two billion people actually have access to water, clean drinking water all the time. Food is such an insecure concept today. Half the world's population don't know what means is going to be available next day. We live in a strange country, my friends. A country of absolute paradoxes. On one side in India, 68% of Indians consume less than 1800 kilocalories per day. And if you just think back of the food you leave on your plates in your messes today, just think about it. And we have 680 million metric tons of food grains rotting in open in the same country. We just don't have the engineers to connect, the post harvest technology to bring it. But solve a simple problem. Then they're too busy doing something else. So what use is life if you're not deciding to live it for others? And in your futures, as you craft it, if you can ask yourself, how am I going to make a difference? What is it I'm going to do to truly make this world a better place? And in that answer, you will discover that you're actually making yourself better. External manifestation of growth is irrelevant if internal evolution of human growth kind doesn't happen. So may you all actually join hands in this urgency, this race to make the world a better place by making ourselves truly better.